Good morning, church, house of the gospel. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for welcoming me. My name is Andre. Pastor Alex reminded me to introduce myself, uh, which for a second sounded kind of weird and strange. I was like, what do you mean introduce myself? This is like my home. And, uh, but I used to be one of the youth leaders here. Uh, I used to be a member here at House of the Gospel uh, before my wife and I moved to Sacramento. And so those of you who are unfamiliar with me, um, this is my home. This is my first home, so to say. So I'm thankful to you guys for having me back, for Pastor Alex and you, the church, giving me an opportunity to share God's word with you. And for those that, of you that are new, I hope to meet you after church and get to know you a bit. Um, so with that being said, church, we're going to be in Mark chapter 11 today. Mark chapter 11. And as you're opening up to that, I just want to talk a little, bit, a little bit about details. Because details are important, right? I mean, a zero makes a huge difference between 100 and 1,000. Or 1,000 and 10,000 right? Man, it would be incredible if somebody ma didn't pay attention to details and accidentally sent you a thousand bucks instead of a hundred on Venmo, right? But also details could be kind of scary, especially in times of urgency. Yesterday, uh, my wife and I drove out to come here to Fresno, and halfway, to, uh, halfway here, she's like, oh, by the way, you grabbed all the clothes, right? You grabbed, and I was like, I think I did. I grabbed, like, I think I grabbed the bags. And it totally blew, like, totally blew my mind how not paying attention to the details, not being mentally present, completely present, sometimes you forget around, about the things that are going on around you, about the things that you are doing. It was, it's one of those moments, like, you get into the car, so some of you who get into the car today after church and you drive home, and then you get home and you don't even realize how you got there, right? If we don't pay attention to details, sometimes very important things can fly past us. And sometimes those things won't make a big difference. Luckily, I didn't forget our clothes yesterday. But at other times, it can make a world of a difference. And today, as we look at chapter 11 of Mark, we will notice how missing a few key details cost Israel a ton. It cost Israel Jesus' life. And although for th that sounds s sad and disheartening, at the end of the day, it was for our own good, right? It worked out because God makes all things work for our good. But yet, that small detail cost Israel a ton, and it caused them to miss Jesus and who he truly was. And so today in chapter 11, as you guys open up, if you're not there already, we will notice how Jesus makes it very clear that he is a king, and he makes it very clear that he is a Messiah, a Savior. And what's interesting is that these Jews who are welcoming him into Israel know that. They accept that. And yet, because of a few key details, they missed the kind of king that he was and what he came to save them from. And so as we uh, read into it today, as we look at that, see the details that I missed, I don't want us to also just kind of look at them, look at them from the outside and think about how foolish were you Israelites? How foolish were you to miss these details and to miss who Christ was? Because at the end of the day, Bible reveals more about us than we can imagine. And so as we read about these Israelites, as we read about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, I just want us to reflect on ourselves, look at the Bible as a mirror of us, look at our own nature, and wonder about the details that we might be overlooking every day. So let's read uh, Mark chapter 11 and go from there. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter in, you will find a colt tied, 
on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Tell them, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And so the disciples went away and found a colt tied to a door outside in the street and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying this colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. And they brought this colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So that is where we will stop today, dear church. So the first thing I want us to note in verses 1 through 8 is that Jesus is the king. He is Lord. And as king and as Lord, we notice that this chapter starts off with a continuation of the first ten. Right? We are flying through the book of Mark. God is showing us his miraculous work. He is showing us that he is king. And as we are flying through these chapters, we notice that along the way, Jesus gets a crowd. And so as a proper king, as a ruler of all things, he is coming into the Jerusalem with crowds following him. He's not coming by himself. He's not coming with just his disciples, but he is coming with a crowd of followers following him. And so I want us to think about this. Among these crowds were his disciples. Among these crowds were Pharisees that hated him. Among these crowds were Lazarus, who he just brought, for, uh, brought out of death a few days earlier, Lazarus' family, there were followers and disciples of Jesus, and then there were other Jews. Jews who were fed by thousands of Jesus' meals and wonderful dinners. Jews who heard his wonderful teachings. Jews who were healed by him. Jews who saw his miraculous works. And we also know that there had to have been Romans present, right? As well as potentially other Gentiles. They were all gathering for one huge purpose, and that was to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. And as they were doing this, they were following Jesus. Maybe some of them were already present there waiting for him. Others were coming with him. But one thing we know for sure is all these people were coming from various backgrounds, different economic statuses, different social backgrounds, different political ideas different religious views, all of them came from different backgrounds and none of them truly, fully understood or knew who Jesus was. They followed him because he was a wonderful man. They followed him because everything he did to them was, for them was awe-inspiring, mind-blowing, but they didn't quite fully understand because they missed some details. In fact, notice what we see in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. And all of the other Gospels give us this information as well, right? But Jesus talks to his disciples and he asks them, Who do you say I am? Who do you tell me that I am? Who do people say I am? And so the disciples responded and they're saying, Well, some said that you are a prophet. Others that you are Elijah. Some say you are John the Baptist. And then finally Peter tells him, he says, you are the Messiah. And yet as we followed Peter's words, he didn't even fully comprehend or understand what that was. Even in calling Jesus the Messiah, when Jesus foretold his death and resurrection, Peter had the guts to rebuke Jesus. Think about what these people 
what kind of misconception these, pe- these people had. They view Jesus as some sort of a king, some wonderful prophet, some wonderful being, but even then they missed who he was. And so here's the first thing I want us to note about this. They loved his miracles, they loved his teachings, they loved his dinners, but they completely missed why he came to earth. And the reason they missed that is because they lacked their knowledge of the scriptures. And by lacking knowledge, it wasn't that they didn't know the information, it's that they didn't see the details that Christ wanted them to see. So church, our reading of the Bible, or lack of it, our detail to the Bible, or lack of it, will shape our view of Jesus. It will shape our view of Jesus. Notice how in John chapter 5, Jesus says something very, very interesting to all of these Jews. He says, if you believed Moses, right, if you read Moses, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. Because he wrote about me. Dear church, our Bible reading, or lack of it, will shape our view of Jesus. And we know that because even by looking at this very simple thing, this simple idea of these crowds following Jesus, right before they start proclaiming him as king, they were confused about who he was. And the same applies to us today. Let's think about that. We live in the United States where we are free to practice wherever religions we want. We have people who are religious all across the country. We have people who call themselves Mormons. There are Muslims. All these people who recognize Jesus and his wondrous works. Just like in the old times when Jesus walked the earth, people called him a prophet. That's what you hear people calling him today. Yeah, he was a wonderful prophet. An incredible teacher. You'll hear people say that he was a revolutionary, a freedom fighter, a political figure who came to change, right? He was was fighting for those who are meek and weak, right? We will give Jesus all sorts of names and recognitions. And yet, how often do we miss the very detail that Jesus is much more than that. You see, oftentimes, just like in this time of these followers that follow Jesus, we want to shape Jesus with our own views. Rather than submitting ourselves to the Bible and letting the Bible shape our view of Jesus, we want Jesus to fit our mold for him. So a question might come up, well, why? Why does that happen? How did these Jews miss what king Jesus was? How did Jews miss exactly who Jesus came, what exactly what Jesus came to do? How can we miss that at times? In, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus says, because their hearts became dull. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and churn, and I would heal them. Their pride and their self-righteousness led to a rejection of Jesus that prevented them from seeing his true royalty, that prevented them from seeing his true mission. And so let, let us come back to Mark chapter 11. And I just want us to pay attention to uh, verses 4 through 8. They went away and found a cold tied to a door. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying this cold? And they told them that Jesus said uh, what Jesus had said, and they let them go. They brought the cold to Jesus who threw, uh, and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many more spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed 
were shouting. So what's interesting here is as these crowds follow Jesus, we notice Jesus do something incredible. For the first time in Mark chapter 11, Jesus takes on this role of being a king and embraces it. Up to this point, at other points of Mark, even when Jesus was followed by crowds, he kind of hid himself away, right? There were moments where, of course, he did miraculous works, and we see that. He did wondrous works, and we see that. He showed himself and proved himself as a king, and we see that all throughout Mark, right? He cast out demons in Mark 1, 5, 7, and 9. We see him heal paralyzed. We see him heal people of skin diseases, of bleeding. We see him heal the deaf and the blind. We see Jesus show his, the fact that he is Lord and master of all things because he, heals, uh, he resurrects people from the death in Mark chapter 5. He resurrects Lazarus in other gospels. And he even defies nature, right? He shows that he is a king and lord of all things by walking on water. He calms the storms. He feeds thousands of people with five loaves and two fish. Jesus shows his kingship through the book of Mark. And yet, as he does these things, he also hides himself slightly, right? He heals people but tells them to remain silent. He casts out demons but says, don't tell this to anybody. He tells the disciples that I am the Messiah, I am Lord who came to die on the cross and to be to resurrect three days later. Sorry for the spoiler alert. But but then he tells them not to tell anybody. But here, for the first time, Jesus embraces his role as a king. He tells his disciples, Go bring this donkey, go bring this colt who's no who's never been ridden. And bring him to me. He sits on this donkey and he rides into Jerusalem as people shout praises and songs of praise to him. And at first glance that might sound a little strange. But what's interesting is that Jesus not only shows us that he knows everything, right? His understanding of what will happen when people go to bring the donkey. But he specifically Make sure to fulfill a prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9. He makes sure to fulfill the prophecy of riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. He wants these people to see exactly who he is. Listen to what Zechariah 9.9 says. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See that your king comes to you. Righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. Jesus is entering this city as a king, but he is entering as a humble king. He's entering as a king, but a gentle one. And that is what the, Jer- the Israelites missed. They missed the kind of king that was coming to save them. And even though Jews are seeing who's entering Jerusalem, they're not perceiving, Matthew tells us, right? Even though they're seeing, they're not fully recognizing who he is. Even though they're seeing him entering humbly on a donkey, they are expecting a ruler who will come and rule with thunder, who will come and free this nation. You see, Israelites shaped their view of Jesus in their minds. They read certain scriptures and their understanding was that Jesus was coming to restore the kingdom of Israelite right then and then. And they completely missed other prophecies that talked to them about him coming and delivering them with his blood on the cross to reunite them back to God. To reunite the entire humanity back to God. They missed the point that he was coming on a donkey and not a war horse. You see, back then, during the time when other rulers were proclaiming themselves to be God, other rulers were seeking worship from their people, other rulers were entering and conquering all of the world around them, right? During the time of Rome, Jesus came as a humble ruler who didn't come to destroy nations, but to bring them salvation and hope. 
who didn't come to rule and kill, but came humbly to bring hope to these people. He didn't come to judge his people in creation, but to restore them. He had a specific mission that they missed. Notice how Jesus enters on a donkey, right? Again, these rulers who were riding into towns and to countries were coming in on a horse. And back then, the meaning of riding a horse was very simple. You came to conquer this land. You came to pillage us. You came to rule over us. But when you came on the donkey, you came in humbly and you came seeking gentleness and peace. You came, you came to restore um, peace between the warring nations. And that's what Jesus was coming to do. He was on a mission to restore his people back to God. Now, the other half of this passage that I want us to focus on is verses 9 through the end. And here we see a very simple phrase, a very simple thing that Jesus does as he enters Jerusalem, right? He comes rolling in and we see another image, uh, another part of his identity that these Israelites recognize. Notice how in verse 9, they, they start to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, dear church, what's interesting about this verse is that Hosanna means a very simple thing. It means the Savior is coming. It's a call, it's not a call of praise, but it's a beg for salvation. They're screaming to him. They're like, Jesus, son of David, Come, save us, bring us salvation, bring us hope, restore this kingdom of Israel that we, we've been ruled by other nations, we are under Rome, come and free us from this slavery. Just as Moses freed us from Exodus, come and free us from these Romans. It's a plea for salvation. They beg Jesus for deliverance. They recognize that Jesus is a Messiah, just as they recognized that he was a king. But again, they missed some details. They missed the details of what he came to deliver them from. And yet, we know why Jesus came. We know what he came to deliver us from. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21, we are told that Christ's death reconciles us to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And in Mark, Jesus tells us himself that he did not come to be served like any other king would expect. He did not come as a savior to be served and to be worshipped directly for being a wonderful ruler. But he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom or a payment for the many. You see, now, today, we know why Jesus came. He came to bring deliverance to you and I from our sin. He came to free us from the bondage of sin and our sinful nature that you and I are born into. But the Israelites missed that. They were expecting a warring ruler, a king who would come and free them from a political bondage. And for us, as we look at that, it might seem crazy, and we may wonder, like, why? How could they miss something so important? How could they focus so much on something so Small, so silly as this political freedom, right? But completely miss the most important thing. The importance of being washed from sin. How could they be so self-righteous and think that they have it all figured out, that they already have this wonderful relationship with God? How could they think and be so fixated on that and miss their entire need for a Savior who would forgive their sins? How could they do that? And here as we wonder about that, as we ask that, this is where I want us to actually take a step back and ask ourselves, well, what about us? This is where I actually want us as a church to challenge ourselves to look back at Scripture as a reflection, as a mirror, and ask, well, how do we see Jesus? 
what kind of a Messiah is he to us? Right? We see him entering Jerusalem and these people begging for deliverance, but the deliverance from the wrong kind of evil. And so as we come to Jesus, knowing that he is a Messiah, what kind of a deliverance do we seek from him? Do we shape Jesus in our minds and our view of, of who he is? Or do we shape Jesus by the scriptures that are, we are told about? Do we want to shape Jesus into our own mold of a king and a savior who serves our purposes? Or do we let the scripture define Jesus for us and tell us what he came to free us from? You see, a lot of times we get so focused on ourselves and our own identities, just as Israelites focused on their own needs, that we forget what Jesus came to free you and I from. And we begin to reshape Jesus into our own Jesus. And instead of serving Jesus of the Bible, we begin to serve our own Jesus. Jesus who doesn't tell us to turn away from sin, but Jesus who might be okay with certain sins. Jesus who didn't come to free you specifically from sin, but came to free you from your guilt of sin. Right? We begin to worship a Jesus who begins to justify things for us. We begin to worship Jesus who should uh, take, away, take care of our physical needs. We begin to wonder and want to worship Jesus who should provide for our financial needs. And our focus from the Jesus of the Bible who came to save us from the bondage of sin shifts from the Jesus of a Bible to our own Jesus. These Israelites missed the real Jesus because they forgot to focus on the scriptures. Instead, they focused on their own needs. And what happened when he didn't fulfill their needs? They crucified him. A few days later, this king who they welcomed into Jerusalem, who they worshipped and begged for salvation, a few days later, they screamed, to crucify him. Some of them, his disciples, maybe didn't shout to crucify him, but they ran from him. Judas betrayed him. They missed what he came to save them from. And so when things got tough, their Jesus fell apart. Dear church, if our Jesus isn't shaped by the Bible, if we miss the point and the, uh, what Jesus came to save us from, if we shape Jesus by our own expectations and our own desires, that Jesus will eventually fall apart. We will crucify the real Jesus, just as these Israelites. We will put him to death because he does not fulfill our pleasures. He does not fulfill our needs. He does not fulfill our political agendas and our political needs. He does not take care of our financial desires. He does not fulfill our physical desires and needs. He doesn't heal us when we need his physical healing, right? He doesn't fill our pockets when we need our pockets filled. He doesn't save our kids when we want him to save our kids. And when our focus of Jesus begin, begins to be shaped by our own desires, we crucify Jesus of the Bible and we start to worship Jesus of our own lives. You see, these Israelites crucified him because he made a few things clear to them and he makes a few things clear to us. In Mark chapter, chapter 1, we notice this as the book, as the letter of God, this gospel opens up, we notice John the Baptist claiming and proclaiming this entry of this king, right? He says, prepare the way for this ruler. He makes it clear that I am the son of God. Next, he makes it clear that my kingdom is near. Again, in Mark chapter 1, if we actually open there right now, verse, uh, verse 15.
Jesus says, this is just as he starts his ministry. Look at what he proclaims about himself. He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Right? They crucified him because he made it clear that I am the son of God. My kingdom is near. Right? It's not their kingdoms, not, not what they expected, but his kingdom is near. And he commanded them to believe and repent. And dear church, his message remains. It hasn't changed. Because of Je- Israelites' rejection of Jesus, you and I now get to read the scriptures and search, Jesus, search for Jesus, see who he truly was, and understand his true message, that he came to serve many, right? To br- be a ransom for many, to die for our sins, He now comes bearing the gospel to you and I, and we get to read that, and we get to reap the benefits of his death. But church, same thing remains. We must believe, and we must repent. We must obey his commands. Again, it's not an invite. It's not a wish for you, right? Jesus doesn't say, just come to me if you wish. Come to me if you please. No, he commands to us, believe, And repent, my kingdom is coming. I will restore it. And we see that all throughout the rest of the book of Mark, and we will see you would see that in Acts and Romans. God commands repentance. He commanded it to these Israelites who rejected him because they wanted a freedom from this earthly Roman Empire. And for us, he commands the same. And so, dear church, I want us to reflect on something, and I want us to ask ourselves, have we given ourselves to the Lord? Do we believe and repent? Maybe some of you are here for the first time, or maybe you've been here multiple times, but you haven't given your life up to Jesus yet, right? Well, he commands you to believe and repent. He died for your sins. And he commands you to repent and to recognize his kingdom. You see, he came before, he came humbly and gently to bring peace to all humanity, but he will return again, and the next time he will come back as a ruler to judge this earth. And maybe some of us are already believers and we say, yes, Andre, everything you're saying is true. Amen to the fact that Jesus is king. Amen to the fact that he is a Messiah. He is my Messiah. But yet, maybe our own experiences and our sins have clouded our view of Jesus. Right? We see that with King David. We see that all throughout New Testament where even believers begin to be hardened by their own sin. They begin to be clouded by their own views of Jesus. It begins to cloud and shift their focus. And so my challenge for you, dear believers, is reflect on your heart and ask the Lord to, to bring back the joy of his salvation. Restore the joy of him who was crucified. Ask him to remove the, st- uh, the stones from your heart. Let us recognize what he truly came to do, which is to deliver us from sin. That is the freedom that he brings. He came to, the, to, uh, he came to free us from the bondage. The bondage of sin. And so, dear church, I just want us to open up to one last passage, and that's in Revelation chapter 19, and we'll read verses 11 through 16. And simply, I want us, as we read that, I want us to think about one thing, right? Here Jesus entered as a king and as a Messiah to save us from sin, to save us from eternal damnation and death. And he will return one more time. And the next time he, return, he comes back, he will again return as a king, and he will again return as a Messiah. But this time when he comes back, he will return to rule. He's not going to come back with gentleness. He's not going to come back lowly and humbly on a donkey, but he is going to come back to rule and to judge this world. 
And so, dear church, let us think about his return that's coming, right? As he says, the kingdom is near. And let us just reflect on our lives. And again, let us ask ourselves, what kind of a Jesus am I serving and worshiping? Are you serving and worshiping a Jesus of the Bible? Or are you serving and worshiping the Jesus that you created of your own life, of your own experiences? So just reflect on that as we read Revelation chapter 19. And then I saw heavens open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in the righteousness, he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a, robe, uh, in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will, tread and wine pre- uh, he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Dear church, Jesus, Jesus is coming back. And he is coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Israelites missed a few details, and missed what he came to save them from. You and I don't get that benefit of a doubt. You and I know that Christ came to give us salvation and to free us from sin. Not only did he die for us and wash that sin away, but now he calls you to live in that freedom. In James, we are told that if you love me, you will obey my commandments. In John, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And in James, we are told that if you love him, you will follow them. Dear church, we are called to live in the freedom that God gives us. So let us turn away from our sins and let us repent. Let us not be ignorant as Israelites were in in Mark chapter 11. Let us pray. Dear Father, today we remember your triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The great and wonderful entry that you made humbly on a donkey. And yet during that entry, Lord, you were praised and worshipped for being a king and for being a savior, a messiah. But Israelites missed what you came to save them from, Lord. They completely ignored that you were there to save us all from the bondage of sin and to restore us to salvation and to restore us to the Father. Father, today we still, all of humanity groans out of sin and out of separation from God. And yet you died for our sins to restore us to Him, Lord. And I just ask you that as we reflect on Mark chapter 11, We may praise you for being a king and for being a Messiah that restored us, who fulfilled his mission of bringing us back into the unity with God. And Father, I ask you that you open our hearts, that you soften our hearts, that you help us see our our reality of our relationship with you. That we may, may be honest with ourselves and that we may see, look at the scriptures and see who you truly were, that we may reflect on our lives and ask ourselves, who is this Jesus that I worship? Is it the Jesus of the Bible who freed me of sin, or is it it a Jesus who I expect to serve my needs? Is it a Jesus who I created with my own imagination and with my own needs? Father, the Israelites thought you failed them, but it wasn't because your mission failed, because you didn't meet their expectations. Lord, so I ask, soften our hearts 
Help us to put our expectations aside. Help us to recognize that your kingdom is coming. Help us to recognize our need for repentance. And help us obey your command to repent, to believe in you, and to turn from our sins, Lord. And where we lack the faith to walk in your freedom, Lord, give us the faith. Give us the faith to believe that you make us free. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andre.